services. What I wanted to share today uh, with you today is is truly work in progress. So um, this is uh, work that um, Judith Green and I have been doing during my sabbatical, and so it's nice to have the the opportunity to <coughs> articulate um, and and. Um, seek feedback from other colleagues in learning sciences from um, various fields as we as we start looking at um, the methodological implications of um, interactional ethnography. So I'll start with um, some orienting premises, pretty straightforward ones, but just thinking about the good old ontology, epistemology and methodology, you know, where, where do I sit? And, and um, this work really sits within an interpreter's framework. So our notions of reality as relative and multiple existing in minds, epistemology, our constructivist notions of knowledge, and in a, in a research context, the notion of research and the researcher co-constructing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, the research team as well um, in, in the approach we take. And of course, this methodology in, in an interpretive framing is about building consensus of understanding. And I, and I really feel that as we've been working on drawing on um, interactional ethnography to, to make sense of, the, of what we're seeing in, in higher education classrooms in Hong Kong, um, it's really helped us in a research team to build consensus of understanding um, from multiple disciplines and multiple theoretical perspectives. And so that's where we sit. I mean, I liked this definition of flicks when I was um, showing this to a student one day. I thought this is a nice, this actually, Uwe Flick does um, uh, research methods books for medical research, medical research. So not an education perspective, but a medical re research perspective. But I thought it was a really nice encapsulation of what we do. We try to formulate these subject and situation related statements which are empirically well founded. I mean, that's a, that's a very easy, straightforward um, notion of quality research in general. Now, when we start thinking about IE, that's when I started thinking further, why are we not? transitioning, there we go. Um, and Uwe Flick also talked about, you know, the object is the determining factor for choosing a method. They're not reduced to single variables, so this is when we're moves, moving out of our positivist frame. I realise I'm selling a Coles in Newcastle, but I wanted this first three minutes to just let you know where my head is. Um, and um, methods are characterised by their openness towards objects. Validity is in reference to the object under study. And that's where we work from when we've been working from this perspective with interactional ethnography. And we think about robustness in terms of empirical grounding, appropriate methods and reflexivity. Has anyone here um, had a, a look at the Joanna Briggs Institute? Um, it's down in oh, Melbourne or Adelaide, down south. Um, they've been working, so we, do you know about the Cochrane Review databases? Well, they've been working up an Australian version of that, um, and it's very health sciences oriented, but they actually have a very nice section on um, undertaking uh, systematic reviews of qualitative studies. And they actually have a very nice framework for assessing qualitative studies. And I had, I re actually um, assessed and examined a thesis from um, Adelaide. Um, and the, it was really a lovely framework because it made me think, oh, yes, am I clear about my own self? You know, I've always said I should be, but, you know, when I go back to my writing, have I actually been truly reflexive and, and clear about my positioning in my research and so forth? So um, I would. I would really sincerely recommend that as a very um, straightforward um, approach to assessing uh, qualitative research. So anyway, that's just an aside. So this is, as you see, much more conversational and presentational. I hope you'll bear with me. And of course, you know, we're drawing on this long history, the, 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 um, uh, the, the discursive, the linguistic turn. So, you know, I think McClure got it really nicely when he was saying that, you know, we are in a different world from that proposed by common sense or scientific region, reason with language reflecting or corresponding to a pre-existing reality. The linguistic turn has insisted all truths are textual and the way that we see the world is always already infected by language. Now, 
what we've done with interactional ethnography is really draw on this, these histories with um, uh, discourse analysis and educational work and look at the textual, but we're actually looking at intertextuality, um, intervisuality, <laughs> bringing on some of their work on visual semiosis and so forth. And um, Judith's been um, putting forward the notion of intercontextuality. So, you know, really playing around with, with drawing on these histories and traditions to think in new, in new ways. So that's been, it's been very exciting. She keeps me on my toes, certainly. And we have very long Skypes between California and here. So Jude, this is one of Judith's slides that she did for us when she did a workshop for our um, uh, uh, graduate students. And, and before we get into interactional ethnography, she was just putting forward the argument that ethnography should be considered not so much as a methodology, but as an epistemology. <laughs> so this is one, one point Judith likes to confront me on all the time, um, because I tend to think in a much more applied and methodological sense, and she thinks in a much more um, conceptual sense. So that's a good, uh, a good pairing, perhaps. So she says that it's abductive, and I went back and did my looked up my definitions. <laughs> so thinking about logical inference from an observation to theory, which accounts for the observation. So she's very strong on this notion that we're working from the premise of abductive reasoning. And um, Joy's got a strong background in mathematics um, and would know that all of this goes into computer programming as well. I was interested when I was looking around definitions. So this notion of iterative and recursive comes up all the time. We're constantly revisiting, moving backwards and forwards between texts, across time, across contexts, as we're looking, looking through um, the process of making thinking and decision making visible. And so the argument that Anderson Levitt put forward is that ethnography is a philosophy of inquiry. So that's where, um, where Judith sits in putting forward that argument. So what the work that I'm sharing with you now is unpublished. We've just um, put the extended abstract um, to the, uh, to the um, editors of the subsection. So this is a, um, an invited international handbook coming out with Rutledge. Um, and um, these are some senior folk in the learning sciences. Cindy Mello Silva uh, has worked very closely with me for a number of years. Um, Cindy's background is problem based learning. And um, she ha has uh, done a lot of work with us in Hong Kong and uh, is now on the equivalent of an ARC discovery uh, with Judith and myself and colleagues in Hong Kong as we're looking at um, uh, problem-based learning and technologies in the health sciences. So um, this, these are some of the connections that are start to start to come together. Uh, Judith talks about the genealogy of th thought and so forth. So this is the invited chapter we've been asked to do. So this was the task. <laughs> so this is what I've been working on. Um, in the section on research methods and analytic strategies, we um, have to give an overview um, and um, we're supposed to share different types of qualitative research approaches as well as basic and more advanced quantitative approaches of measurement of learning for the measurement of learning and change and further focus on mixed methods and approaches to design based research. So it was really interesting. Judith wrote with um, a um, uh, a past student who had also visited us in Australia, if you remember, Aldra. Um, they'd written their first piece for um, a learning sciences piece because it, even though I belong to a learning sciences institute, I hadn't actually seen where interactional ethnography fitted with all of that. I was merrily charging along with my own projects because I was passionate about it. And um, we, uh, we've had a lot of focus on the uh, educational neuroscience work. And um, I've sort of been poking away at this and we've been very successful with this in, a, in another direction. But where the two met was an interesting sort of challenge. And then Cindy said, you know, I'd like you to write up IE for this book, you know. And so that really had us thinking. So um, it first of all had me thinking about, well, where where do I situate IE with the learning sciences? And as I said in the abstract I sent you, you know, this, this shared focus on interdisciplinarity is, is key because, um, you know, as Keith Sawyer said in, that, in the book, we, did, we contributed the chapter on PBL to that 2014 book, Cindy and I, and uh, Jingyan Lu from Hong Kong. But um, 
you know, when in his introduction, Keith said, you know, it brings together folk from all of these different disciplinary and theoretical orientations. Now, interactional ethnography started at the Santa Barbara classroom discourse group um, with the University of California, and they saw it as an interdisciplinary set of social, cultural, education, discourse theories from anthropology, education, linguistics, sociology. And this is key. This is where I made my, where it really clicked with me, creating an orienting framework we use to examine the social construction of life, including identities across times and over events. So once, once we get the notion of interactional ethnography anchoring us to an orienting theory to then give us a rigorous entry into conducting and designing the study, then we can draw on all of these other learning sciences theories as explanatory theories to look at the phenomenon. So this is where, for me, it's, it seems a simple formula, but for me that made an awful lot of sense as we were, um, as I was working with the method and, and writing up. Now Judith will already slap me over the wrist for saying method, okay? So I was working with the um, logic of inquiry. <laughs> But uh, as I say, I'm, much, uh, I'm very much um, applied in when I'm thinking about it. Now, the other shared interest, as I was thinking, why, why does the Handbook of Learning Sciences want us, was the notion of systemic research. So um, that, you know, the learning sciences is, is actually trying to broaden a notion and, and encapsulate the complexities of learning in formal and informal settings. And this notion of system level units of analysis better preserves the essential qualities of the learning environment um, analyzing phenomena, rather than analysing the phenomenon by reducing it to factorable elements. You know, so we, we have this constant tension be trying, between trying to have something that's a, a tightly designed study that's, that's um, well controlled to the reality of the messy organic nature of learning and interaction and classroom life and system life and so forth and the, and the interactions between systems on, on the classroom. So we all recognise these and as we, we work through our research designs and so forth, we're constantly battling these tensions. Um, now what happens with interactional ethnography is that we start to move beyond the constraints, I'm being filmed here, I'm conscious, beyond the constraints of conversation analysis and I work with conversational analysis studies, ethnomethodological approaches have been very dear to my heart for a long time and we have another ARC on CA with Paul Drew, if you are a conversation analysis person, Paul's working very closely on clinical communication with me and that fits those questions beautifully and it does that job. But I've always struggled with, C with ethno methodology and particularly CA as an in the moment analysis when learning is, is, is ramped up over time, you know. So I, I've always struggled with that tension and that's why IE makes sense for me. So here we're looking at whole part, whole relationships um, in order to uncover system level units that shape what counts as learning or learnings. So Judith talked about um, making visible the invisible, that's one of her um, catch cries, and making ordinary the extraordinary. Um, and the CA folk would be talking about doing the same thing, making the, the ordinary extraordinary. So looking at ordinary and natural and making it extraordinary. Um, so what are some central goals? Okay, just as in um, uh, our normal ethnographic process, we want to uncover emic, insider, ways of knowing, being and doing everyday life in educational environments and thinking about what shapes what counts as learning as well as what learning counts in a developing setting. Okay, so what counts as learning and what learning counts in a setting. Another central goal is, is this tracing and this is where I really like it because we get this across time over context notion happening. Tracing how and what members in settings propose, recognise, acknowledge and interactionally accomplish. So you can hear some of that ethnomethodological talk in the background there. Um, as socially and academically significant. So we seek to develop grounded accounts of what constitutes opportunities for learning through which local knowledge is constructed. So we're still looking at that knowledge constructed in situ for both the collective 
and individuals within the collective. Okay, so it's it's really trying to embrace a lot of things. Um, and uh, as a conceptually div div uh, driven approach, we see it investigating opportunities related to epistemic understandings as the phenomenon are being constructed um, through interactional, intertextual. I'm arguing for more intervisual, and that's what the work in Hong Kong with our PBLN technologies is really starting to highlight. And Judith said this is where our, our applied work in Hong Kong is contributing to her thinking because we're seeing all of this work of the intervisual happening so much. Um, and uh, the referential and intertextual nature of classroom life in and over time. You'll hear those things coming around a lot. So you're already hearing language coming from interactional sociolinguistics. You're already hearing language from ethnomethodology ethno and DA. And uh, Michael Agar um, has, has done some lovely work um, on ethno ethnography um, in terms of um, rich cases and telling points. Um, and so these are so rich points and Mitchell's telling cases. And so these are all aspects that we see uh, colliding as we come into there. Um, Judith um, did some work on, okay, that didn't, that didn't come up. That's very interesting. We lost, lost two slides, but that's okay. This was actually, as I said, Judith's been interested. She's just hitting her retirement. She's um, going to be retiring at the end of this year. And she did a tracing, I'm sorry, I don't know why we've lost the, the visuals, uh, of her own um, genealogy of thought. So she's actually written that up just recently and looked at her own PhD th thesis under John Gumpers in sociolinguistics moving forward as she's gone from a very um, uh, controlled design, uh, classic design, through to something getting more and more messy and ever expanding as she's worked with um, since the 90s with the um, uh, Santa Barbara Classroom Discourse Group. So um, if, you ask, if you ask Judith to write with you, this is the kind of sentence you come up with. Okay. <laughs> so we, we said we wanted to, uh, we, we actually are modelling the paper. I found something by James Heap on applied ethnomethodology, where he talked about what big questions does it offer and so forth. And so we're going to kind of create a little bit as we write this up, a bit more of a conversation with Heap and so forth and acknowledge that process. But, Big questions, how, in what ways, with and for whom are learning opportunities constructed in particular environments, with what kinds of outcomes or consequences for subsequent actions by both collective and individuals within the developing collective. When, in what ways and at what level of analytic scale can learning processes, opportunities and outcomes be made visible? through an interactional ethnographic epistemology that examines the iterative, recursive and non-linear work of actors engaged in constructing learning opportunities of self and others. So all that background I've given you, that, that sits with our questions. Now, interestingly, if we think about the interdisciplinary team, and we're really seeing that with work in Hong Kong, um, because uh, Judith positions our disciplinary colleagues as cultural guides. So uh, when I do an, um, uh, an interactional ethnographic study, I'm actually co-researching with the disciplinary specific person. So I'm not a medical educator, I'm not a dentist, I'm not a speech hearing pathologist, but those educators from those disciplines are on the team. So as we are looking and talking, analysing videos together, we're all seeing different things from different perspectives. And so some fabulous discussions have come out and some fabulous, um, well, hopefully fabulous analyses <laughs> if we get them all written up. But we're only in our first year of that very big study. So, the, so we have roles as a team, as both learners and analysts, and we do take up our various theoretical stances and, and even disciplinary stances. And so um, this is an interesting thing in terms of uh, other research methods. We had one colleague turn up from the UK, and I apologise that I can't remember her name, but her, th her current research is on research teams. So she's videoing research teams and looking at how they collaborate and how they do research and come to um, uh, 
notions of how they develop their analysis and so forth. And so there you go, there's another interesting, interesting aspect of interaction to think of. Um, so we look at how collective activity creates potential opportunities um, and how we learn from the collective activity and make visible certain things. We've just done a lovely piece of analysis um, with my colleague from medical education um, and uh, worked through the methodology and it also enlightened him as to how the students were working and the things that he put faith in that should happen when he walks out of the room, we actually saw them in action as we had the ethnography collecting all the student artefacts and data. And he was like, oh, they did do that. Oh, they did, oh. <laughs> and so a lot of problem-based learning is about trusting the students. And so it was very interesting to see that that happened. And, and also this notion of case and cross-case analysis. So some principles of operation, we construct an explanation of the cultural processes, practices, meaning and knowledge, previously unknown, um, using this logic that we've talked about. Field workers should uphold the attempt to leave aside ethnocentrism. This is something that Judith's also talking about. Us as researchers in the research analytic moment and in the collection of field work to, to step back from our ethnocentric, ethnocentric in terms of our disciplinary and theoretical stances, which is an interesting swing on ethnocentrism. Um, and maintaining open uh, acceptance um, of the behaviours and actions of the members being studied. And the data should be, pieces of the culture should be related to existing knowledge about other components of the whole. So that's our whole part whole. Um, this is an interesting moment where we've had these discussions about holding theory, method, relationships constant, because this is where the logic started helping me in thinking about shaping designs. So we get a systematic approach of making visible how life in particular classrooms or settings shapes particular opportunities. And we engage in the cross-case analysis and we identify what the Santa Barbara group have called consequential progressions within and across. So their work started in um, tracing uh, one teacher in um, and her literacy practices in primary schools. Um, our work has moved it into higher education and um, she has many students now in the US also working in higher education in the area. So we have a conceptually organised archive, a systematic approach to analysing mostly video records but we do draw in other ethnographic artefacts at multiple levels of scale. Um, and we're thinking about how these are intertextually tied. So how do we, how do we go about it? I've got um, three examples of some work we've done. Um, and all three have been um, reasonably recently published. So the, uh, the way we were asked to do the chapter, interesting in terms of structuring the, the, meth the methodology section, was that we had to we had to frame the, um, the methodology, inverted commas, in terms of learning sciences. We had to show how it was done and then we had to give three case examples. So we're using one of mine and um, two from the States as our case examples in five, five to 6,000 words. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a challenge in and of itself. So this is, uh, this is a, a whole sort of series of, of pieces in action. So all of this work is looking at the problem-based learning cycle of inquiry and various folk are very au fait or not with PBL. So I'm not going to do a whole treatise on PBL, um, but I was interested in how the problem-based learning cycle, be it one or two or three tutorial structure, how the cycle from introducing a new case through to thinking through the process with whichever scaffolds you put in there, through to coming up to some resolution and deeper understanding of the case, how that cycle um, worked when we had it um, occurring in different curriculum models and in uh, with different technologies. So this paper was um, when we were looking at multimodality and our question was about multimodal text supporting knowledge construction. And so in this one, we looked across student learning environments. So we had recordings of the PBL um, tutorial classrooms and recordings as they went into self-directed learning phase. And you know how that's such a black box trying to actually record students when they're off in their own um, study. So actually I invited the group to go up and do their self-directed learning 
in the lab so we could video what they were doing but left them then to it. Um, and the overtime was, was focused on the one problem cycle. So this is about a two week cycle where the students have worked through this process. So um, once again, for some reason, my anything that's an image cut and paste in there isn't coming up. Don't know why. Anyway, the, construct, the constructs, the historical overtime analysis, whole part whole and consequential progression. How do you actually show this then? is by constructing event maps, okay? So what, what you do with an event map is that you're trying to show, uh, to situate your telling case or your anchor moment, that, that moment where you're looking through the video data going, how did that happen? What, why did that happen? How, what was that rich point? Agar's rich <coughs> points, um, Mitchell's telling case. What, why did that happen? So. Um, what we did is situate across the curriculum. We looked at in, uh, this one was um, broken up into two modules per semester, and this is the ninth problem in that cycle. And then we looked at learning events incorporating online learning objects. So that was the first focus. So I kind of went in, I had the recordings, um, and then it was a matter of going, okay, well, how do we actually start looking at it in terms of learning objects? So in the, the problem, Two-Face, they usually have a, have a, a story title to them, a semi-narrative structure, um, had three events. Day one, we had the formal tutorial face-to-face. -face. After that, they had the self-directed um, learning where they went upstairs. They, of course, did more self-directed learning, but this is what I captured. And then they had the, to, uh, the tutorial. And then we looked at it as a systematic um, phasing in terms of the learning objects, so how they read the problem statement, how they logged into the learning management system, when they discussed the video that was provided. So, so all of those actions were linked across the learning objects. And then we had the self-directed learning. Once again, this, their activities as they moved to that, oh, don't tell me the video, visuals aren't going to come up at all. Oh, dear. So this became my anchor point because we had on the final day, and this is where the forward and backward mapping happens. On the final day, we had this student explain the facial nerve in this amazing um, uh, handling and control of the academic discourse. And it moved from tutorial one, where they were discussing that video, with very much lay language. So in tutorial one, the student, they've just watched a video of a person talking, right? Uh, the person and the students say, okay, we don't know what like, um, he injected his face with something. This is in dentistry and they're looking at facial um, musculature. Um, it's just, he just, you know, temporary like something. So why his face is frozen like that? Um, is it because he has like a sickness? So what do you see? What do you see facilitated doing the questioning? Well, concentrate on one side of the face. Uh-huh, he cannot swallow. Okay, cannot drink. So what's the problem? Cannot control the face. Oh, is that something to do with facial muscle? Yes, yes. So what kinds of muscles, all right? So we've got this learning discourse happening. And a student X comes up with uh, something to do with facial nerve. All right. So we've, we've hit this point going from his face looks frozen to a student putting forward the tentative hypothesis that this might involve the facial nerve. Right. So they'll do this kind of work all throughout the tutorial. But here's an excerpt of talk. Then they go into their own work. Now, these are multilingual students, so the majority um, Cantonese speaking. So interesting in terms of which languages they choose to, to work in in their social and academic spaces. So the students click on um, an animation. So now in their own time, they've actually found an animation and they're working through it. Um, and the animation is for the anatomy of the face. Um, okay, so this is the Maceta, it controls um, uh, mastication, look at the muscles. Student, for those linguists here, back to English, English is okay. So very interestingly, when we're doing our social talk, we'll stay in Cantonese. And uh, Clarence, I don't know how your Chinese is, but I hope my, uh, the, my um, RAs and research team got their Chinese right there. And um, then the students 
moved to English and said, okay, origin, the region isn't where a muscle is attached, which doesn't move. So actually they're doing first year anatomy origins and insertions, but the PBL problem has led them to starting to explore this on their own, okay? Which is, which is how PBL is structured as a learning um, design. And so they go for this, okay, then they start reading about insertions and they start reading about attachment points and start talking about zygomatic arch and that starts moving out of my disciplinary knowledge, right? So that's day one, day two. And then look at the, this one's actually the end of the week. A student pulls up a facial nerve image on the screen sharing with the rest of the group and their facilitator after they've gone and done their learning and said, okay, this is the greater petrosal nerve, it's a synapsis with this, et cetera, et cetera. And we go into this very sophisticated disciplinary discourse. And then we go into students questioning each other and um, interacting with the image on the, on the whiteboard, okay? So in the event, by constructing an event map, tracing across time, finding our rich point, finding our anchors, Going back to the text, and I'm sorry, the intervisual has not come up. <laughs> the, um, we actually have screen captures of student talk, gestures, and actual the um, objects on the screens. And so then, as I said, thinking about, we've held the orienting theory to our methodology. So we're thinking about social construction of knowledge. But then we've seen how that occurred. So what explanatory theories could I draw upon to say, okay, this phenomenon as we've disclosed it through this approach, what, how can we then think about explaining it? And of course, that's where I started working with Gunter Kress's readings on intervisuality and thinking about the intervisual links between all of those um, texts and artefacts. And also we were talking, Joseph was talking about um, uh, Vygotsky and work and uh, mediating tools and so forth. So we get into this notion of semiotic mediation with the online system, with the interactive whiteboard, etc. So this second study um, we put into, um, uh, this was a sort of retrospective for a um, uh, celebration of Howard Barrows, who um, is one of the founders of, the, uh, of PBL and medical education. So um, the Interdisciplinary Journal of PBL did a, um, a, a special um, co edited collection and we put a piece in there on our interactional ethnography. I'm just paying attention to the time. So we're, we focused on learning technologies a bit more here on interactive whiteboards. If we can't see the visual, this is really going to be rubbish. But anyway, another, um, another event map, anchoring in time across the, the, the year of the curriculum. The new project we're trying to anchor across the years of the curriculum, ramping it up, so the scalability, and across contexts of the curriculum from PBL to clinical learning. So that really is highly ambitious, <laughs> but good fun. So um, once again, in this one, we did we looked at problem exploration. This is a very complex one because it's a third year group. And so they have a lot more disciplinary language. They're looking at um, radiographs. Why? Mm, okay. So we have radiographic um, photographs, images um, for the problem as stimuli for the problem to stimulate the inquiry. And then we have um, the students going into the, and what happened here was what Judith would talk about. I'll get all of this data and get to the talk. Um, what Judith would talk about is a, a frame clash where a student was getting it wrong. So we get this idea about um, the problem statement. Does anyone have to add, um, discuss this photo, a concave profile. So this was the point about the profile of the face as they're looking at um, actual oral maxillofacial surgery and a facial profile. Um, and the facilitator asking where they got terms from. Okay, the, describing the photo, the profile, um, the facial proportion, um, and then they talk about reduced lower facial height. What is normal? What is lower height? Me where do you measure from, etc. And then they, a student starts making a hypothesis. I won't go through all of this technical dentistry talk, but um, the student makes a hypothesis, obviously has this moment where they've sort of got a bit stuck. And the student went silent 
from that point in the tutorial. So sometimes, and I had another student do a PhD on silence in PBL, which is just fascinating, because it's the silent moments that can actually be very telling. So this student went quiet from there on. Then we go into when they're in their self-directed learning and they start looking up all of these um, all of these terms and start thinking back about malocclusion and effect and growth and effect. So that student still hasn't said anything to her colleagues like, I'm confused about this and I'm trying to find it out. But by looking at the talk, by looking at what they, she's searching on, we can actually see the archive of what she's been searching. We can see that she's leading towards poking away at this critical point when she went quiet in class after putting forward a hypothesis that sort of didn't seem to be a winner. Then the student comes up and um, starts trying to explain things and the teacher goes, okay, just draw it. Um, and then we go to this lovely moment with, sorry, I'm, I've zoomed forward, and the student goes up to draw it and then starts talking about rotation, angles, etc. And I really like the way the student sits down and says, no, no, I didn't draw it round enough, I'll draw it again, and gets back up and fixes the work and so forth. But they've actually got it in their head now. After, after the problem was posed of the hypothesis that didn't quite work, the self-directed learning and the individual research and reading coming forward producing a new individual text, sitting down and actually having the agency to say, no, I'm still not happy and interrupting the class to go back up and redo as all being part of the individual process that happened. So I talked uh, here when I was thinking about explanatory theories, well, I thought about um, Meryl Swain's work on languaging as well. You know, I had a, um, applied linguistics part of my story in the background and I was thinking about that making meaning and shaping knowledge and experience through language, which we absolutely see when we're doing discursive analysis. Um, but also this notion of flexible knowledge, which is one of the key features of PBL, thinking about um, knowledge as something that's limber, malleable, and how we move through stages of knowledge. So the la this latest one we've just published in um, the book we've just done, um, uh, myself, um, Lapke Chan from Medicine, and um, uh, Cindy Mello Silva, um, which is um, an edited volume with Springer on educational technologies. And we did part A and part B. Part A was the PBL section, and part B was the um, in clinical context. So we had colleagues from all around the world um, giving us how they were doing just-in-time anatomy maps, apps for bedside teaching and learning and so forth. So it's, a, it's really quite a diverse um, collection and, and good fun. So this is the one um, we had done for that. This was fun because as we were going through our corpus, and, and looking at our work with interactive whiteboards, we had realised that we actually had across the corpus the same problem scenario. So think about the number of times you redo a lesson, you know. So you had the same problem scenario, different facilitators, but over time, the same problem scenario, but with new technologies in the room. So we wanted to look at the effects of technology on group dynamics and collaborative learning. Um, and particularly with the introduction of an interactive whiteboard. So if you were thinking about intervention studies, then you'd say the interactive whiteboard was the, was the intervention. But of course, that was the intervention in terms of me as, as a role in learning and teaching and introducing them, but it wasn't the research design. So it was a true lived experience, as Gertz would say. So I looked at interactions. We had um, two first-year PBL groups um, and um, 20809, same problem, but it was prior to the redesign and remodelling of the space. And then 2013, 12, 13, we had the interactive whiteboards in place. And we have recordings of those and did a comparative study this time. So the previous study stayed within that curriculum, within that same group. Now we're actually trying to leverage, so we're sort of doing cross case analyses over time. So that was fun and I'm going to cry because my visuals aren't there. Okay, what happened here in this one is that the um, facilitator, and I'm not going to read through all the text, but I've actually just put in red the facilitator's activity. So what happened is the problem asked students to look at three different government websites. 
So the problem statement was about epidemiology and they had to look at different websites and look at different physical handbooks, lots of materials going on. The facilitator in, and this was a new problem back then on the WHO page, they had to go there. And you see this problem where you had, at that point, laptops only just being introduced by students. So the mobile device phenomenon we experience now was only just happening. So the group fragmented into dyads or triads around laptops. People got up and got laptops and set them up. You know how messy all of that can be in a, in a room. And then the facilitator is trying to discuss this page. The facilitator ended up having to physically get out of his chair and walk around and point. You know that, that terrible moment in a, in a tech lab when you've got um, a million students on different pages on a screen, okay? So all of this happened as they're working through that problem. So it had this enormous impact on the group dynamic. In the next one, we had this shared visualisation. The group stayed static. We had the interactive whiteboard at the end and students, the scribe, the PBL scribe was linked as I am to this display, was linked. And so students were saying, oh, just go down a bit, go to the website, go down a bit. And then they'd all be looking at the same thing, be literally on the same page visually. And the discussion ran very differently. Um, once again, apologies why we don't have that there. So we had shared visualisation and then we had shared mediation as well because we had the scribe recording the notes and putting them up onto the shared screen while the students were discussing and um, the students directing the scribe to change um, text, change uh, from websites and so forth as they discussed. So the first one, Group fragmentation was our problem, social cohesion reduced, um, collective co cognition inhibited. And then the facilitator behaviour became more about supporting cohesion because PBL is very much focused on group cohesion in the, in the dynamic. Um, in 2013, we had varied individual accessing of multiple online resources. So all the students in 2013 still had their own laptop. The scribe had the me had the central laptop with the with the visualization on the screen but they worked much more cohesively as a group even though we had more media and more visualizations in the room their dynamic was much more uh, fluid and uh, cohesive so that was really an interesting thing so we had these implications about thinking about um, IWBs and, and mediation um, and um, thinking about the repertoire of facilitator strategies. And so Cindy and I are doing another thing for a Wiley handbook on facilitator strategies with technology and all this work is informing how we're thinking about that. So um, I, I did like the point that um, uh, Neil Mercer and who is how? I'm sorry, I don't know. Do we know that person? Neil Mercer and somebody. <laughs> I know Neil, um, was, was making this argument about sociocultural perspectives because I think, you know, sometimes in, a, in our qualitative work with the, with the social and the cultural, we, we start leaving the, the, the mind out of things. <laughs> and so I, I think it's important that we, that we move theoretically and, and, and perhaps we've, we've had our time to, to um, establish the validity and the warrant for qualitative approaches and so forth. But we do have to think about individual processes of thinking and learning. And this relationship between social activity and individual thinking, vital and distinctive characteristic of human cognition, which underpins cognitive development. I mean, every teacher will say, sure, yeah, sure. But I think as, as we've built our fields, we sometimes tend to bifurcate and create walls around, around some thoughts. Um, so um, we think that, that that study also supports a, a knowledge of uh, notion of knowledge as shared property um, and the cultural tool appropriation. And just to finish off, so we see IE as drawing on particular theoretical developments, as you've seen from all these fields, and trying to construct this notion of a logic in use, a logic in use, and. We want to identify and construct boundaries of relevant units for analysis. So we've tried to 
still retain an, a sense of empirical rigour, creating boundaries, but also being clear about, about the larger picture beyond what perhaps an ethnomethodological study in the moment could give us. Um, and thinking about these referential and observed links between units of analysis and thinking about multiple levels of scale. So, so this new study we're doing, as I said, is trying to scale up even, even further. And, um, and that's us. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>